So now we have uh, another fireside chat. This time, uh, these guys are from Israel. Now we're going to bring you guys some, uh, some friends from Asia. We have with us Jeff Char, who is a serial entrepreneur and investor. He sold companies to Lucent and also to Suzuki Manufacturing. We have with us Danny Chu, uh, who is a famous entrepreneur and investor in Japan, as well as being um, the son of Jimmy Chu, the famous fashion designer. And finally, we have with us Razmik um, Hovagimian, who is the co-founder and CEO of Vicky, a company that was re recently sold to Rack 10 for $200 million. So I'll bring them out right now. You, uh, Jeff? Four of us. There's, right. there's four of us today. That's okay. right. Just keeps me company. <laughs> so um, thanks a lot for showing up and um, wanted to kind of crank up the energy a little bit higher. Uh, <coughs> so I invited two of my favorite people, um, Danny Chu and Rasmik. And um, I thought we'd start off by first, I think everybody here is either an entrepreneur or an investor. Actually, can I see hands? How many entrepreneurs? Good. Excellent. Okay. Um, I, I think a lot of us, you know, we all read TechCrunch and, and the other uh, industry papers, and um, I think there's a, a bit of a misunderstanding or kind of overemphasis on raising capital, especially venture capital. And while that's great for accelerating your company, uh, it's not correct for all companies. And so I thought we'd start off with, with Danny's story, and um, why don't you take it away? All right. I think I have a keynote. Uh, do I have a keynote? It's going to work. There you go. Okay, it's a quick keynote, a uh, quick rundown um, of what I do, uh, basically. So, um, originally born and raised in the UK. Uh, this is what I normally do when I'm back in the UK. Uh, some of you may have seen the Dancing Storm trip on YouTube, and uh, that's, that's me over there. And uh, so, I've been in Japan. Uh, let's have a look. How this works. Okay, been in Japan for about uh, 15 years. Uh, uh, for about 15 years and spent most of my time in the IT industry over here, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and uh, Japan Airlines as an engineer. And then I left corporate uh, to set up uh, a company where I run a brand called Culture Japan, uh, which basically shares and makes uh, Japanese culture more accessible uh, to the world. And uh, last year, I w became a member of um, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, government. Uh, they have METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. So they put me on this board to help um, proliferate uh, Japanese um, culture around the world. So this is what we uh, do uh, really briefly. So we do um, TV production. We've got uh, two TV shows broadcast uh, to around 81 million homes in Asia and uh, the US. And uh, we do events. And uh, we also do uh, content and product uh, development. And all of our business revolves around our mascot character called Mirai Suenaga. And uh, this is her over here. <coughs> so Mirai, she's got uh, lots of fans um, around the world and who we reach out to through our social networks and our TV shows. And uh, we have an event called Culture Japan Night and uh, we reach out to them uh, through these events as well. So the most people that would come to these events, uh, the most we've had is around 7,500 people attend uh, over two days in Penang last year. And uh, some of them bring along their dolls. And so there's a, a huge market for these dolls. They're around 60 centimeters tall. Uh, they cost between 500 US and 5,000 USD. And at uh, some of my events, um, there's, um, they bring along uh, quite a few hundred of them, like this over here. And so Mirai, she's become a mascot character for uh, Japanese tourism as well. And we make maps and we distribute them around the world. Uh, so we've made uh, lots of uh, Mirai merchandise as well, like figures and so on and so on. And our next um, uh, merchandise um, basically helps answer the question of how to become a real man. And we all know that uh, you basically start off uh, by playing uh, with dolls, as uh, Arnold has um, uh, proved to us. So uh, we've got this doll over here. So this is a doll uh, modeled after my mascot character. Uh, I call it a um, smart doll. And uh, this is one of the reasons why it's called Smart Doll. So uh, this started off as an April Fool's. I, so we were manufacturing the doll, and I said, okay, for April 1st, let's say that it's a Terminator, uh, based after 
uh, Arnold. And uh, so these renders, um, they attracted lots of attention from the Japanese robotics industry. And I said, I contacted them and said, um, let's, let's do this. And uh, we, we made this robot um, over here. So basically, if it was just like a, a normal robot, it would have um, probably died off like um, Ibo did. And um, so we've um, done a little bit more with it. Um, so um, you attach it to many uh, APIs, so like Twitter, Facebook, Calendar, so on and so on. Uh, she teaches you Japanese. Uh, downloadable add-ons from uh, Google Play. Uh, no need to be lonely anymore because she keeps you company. And hopefully she will uh, replace your mobile phone. And so this is a, hold on, <laughs> a motion video of her. Now she's wearing a bikini so that you can see that we've developed uh, server motor small enough uh, to fit inside uh, this shell over here. And that's the only reason uh, why she's wearing uh, this bikini. So the movements are a little bit uh, rough around the edges. And uh, but it's been really uh, a challenge developing these motors that um, fit um, inside over here. Anyway, so we're, we've made a version which is non-robotic uh, for people who are scared of robots. And this is uh, a skeleton version uh, over here. And this will be out uh, this quarter. And so she's made and uh, developed in Japan and all designed in 3D. Uh, uh, manufacturing uh, utilizes a 3D printing. And this is the roadmap over here real quick. Here, uh, so she's going to cost uh, 600 USD. Uh, released uh, this quarter, uh, there will be anime moving, uh, movie licensing uh, this autumn. Uh, about 2,000 units this year, uh, 10,000 units for next year, and the automatic, uh, the robotic version uh, at the end of this year. Uh, that's a ballpark figure for the price, uh, the retail price. Uh, 2,000 units in 2015. Uh, Google Play uh, motion add-ons in 2015 as well. So uh, just a little bit uh, about us, and we'll finish now. Uh, so we made uh, 5, 500K, a half a million USD revenue in 2013. Uh, six full-time employees, uh, no external investors. So basically bootstrapped with um, earnings from uh, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, stock options, so on and so on. Uh, I've done some uh, affiliate earnings as well. And um, while I was working for Amazon, Microsoft, I had this little small uh, side business on the side, uh, which uh, made websites, basically. And uh, at the moment, it's sustained uh, purely by um, merchandise, uh, Mirai Suenaga merchandise. And from now on, the growth would be uh, direct sales of um, uh, Mirai, this um, smart doll, and the licensing of this body for many manufacturers who want to make uh, their own characters, like anime characters, or like Marvel or DC characters as well. And uh, we'll be working with um, some telcos uh, in Malaysia for the automatic uh, version. So this is the evolution of uh, communication devices. In 2007, we had the iPhone over here, and uh, in 2013, uh, Samsung. But again, it's like the form, they've become like faster and uh, like slimmer, but they kind of like maintain the same sort of form. And I kind of like want to change the form a little bit so that they uh, look like this uh, in 2020. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Razmik, what's your story? My story, that's hard to pull up. I think I'm in the wrong business. So <laughs> we are with Vicky. Uh, started it as a class project in uh, 2007, but took it seriously in 2010. Left NBC Universal and um, built what we look at as the, a global TV site. Basically, we license content from 50 different countries. Think about us as a Hulu or a Netflix, but from around the world, all global content. But what's different about us is it's all powered by fans. We have 70,000 fans that create subtitles on the fly. It's crowdsourced subtitles, so you can watch Japanese anime in Arabic, or a Korean drama in Dutch, or a Dutch movie in Bahasa, Indonesia. So what this does is increases the market size by 4x. So all of a sudden, TV series from one country can start traveling, and we're bringing down language barriers that stand be between great entertainment and the fans. Uh, we bootstrapped initially, and then uh, our professor in class put, uh, put money into it. Then. Um, we put our life savings, then we borrowed money from our mother-in-laws. My co-founder borrowed from his mother-in-law, I borrowed from mother-in-law. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> it scared us. And once you borrow from your in-laws, you make sure that you gotta pay it back. <laughs> so, uh, so we jumped, yeah, I left in 09. I uh, raised a Series A around um, August 2010, came out of beta in December 2nd, 2010. And uh, we built it out. We have about 30 million users around the world every month. 18 million of them are on mobile. Um, and we're just bringing down this language barrier, so we're growing it. We raised Series A, then a B, a 20 million round. Then just this past September, before our three-year birthday, uh, we had an exit. 
I heard a number, it's undisclosed, so I won't comment on it, but what I can tell you is uh, it was the hardest decision I had to make. Mm -hmm. We had two options, we had two term sheets actually for a Series C, and uh, we wanted to play the long game. So we felt this is the only way we can give it wings. The content business is a tough one. And it's our next phase of growth. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that journey. Okay, so how much money was reported in the press? Uh, the press number was 200. 200 million dollars? 200 million. Okay. And what percent of the company did you own at that point in time? Uh, as three founders, I won't tell you the details of how we've done it, but uh, we made sure that at least... Even don't if don't we worry, lose, it's no, private. No, no. We're not no, going to no, tell anybody else. I'll tell you what I can tell you. I can tell you that uh, we didn't have majority, but we had board control. So I gave up more equity. I diluted, I gave more slices of the pie just to be able to protect the vision. Okay. Since we were especially building it from Singapore and not in the Valley, despite the Valley DNAs we had and we started in the Valley, um, it was difficult to kind of give away the control from folks that are not there and wouldn't get it. So we traded off equity for focusing on the vision and being able to drive it. Okay. So you raised, what, 4.3 million? 4.3, then 20 million. In the Series A? Series B. And then 20 million in the Series B. And then we were going to raise about 25 million as a Series C, but okay. we chose the exit path. So tell me the time frame. When did you start the company? When did you convince your mother-in-law to give you money? Yes. When did you raise financing from outside? So we started it as a class project, left it on the side for two years from uh, 08 onwards, 08 to 010. But um, I left NBC, I left my job in 2009, around November. Uh, we, at that point, put our own money and mother-in-law money <laughs> and launched as a company um, in December. And at that, at that time, I think two months before that, our Series A had come in. Okay. So they often say that venture capital is the most expensive money that you can take, but I think Probably mother-in-law money is even more expensive. <laughs> you know what? The one thing, though, is they didn't take equity. So I feel bad. So now I'm making up for it. Whenever I see my mother-in-law, uh, it's time to take care of him because uh, initially <laughs> it was just like return the money whenever you can with some interest on it. So that was a cheap form of uh, finance. It was debt. Okay. It was debt. It was a loan. And in terms of VCs, the, um, the important thing for us was that we get the right group. And I felt raising from the right VCs, like from you know, a reputable team that can really help you drive it, is always going to be a little bit of an insurance policy to be able to raise a B and a C. Mm -hmm. So we got Greylock and Reese and Horowitz and some amazing angels, okay. like Joe Ito, who was very, very helpful, all the way to the exit, actually. What did you look for when you were deciding which venture capital to take? I was getting a lot of no's for nine months until I met Reed Hoffman from Greylock, the, the founder of, sure. uh, of LinkedIn. LinkedIn yeah. And um, I just clicked. I think he got the model. And um, Joe Ito, at that point, also started talking to us. His sister, he has the MIT Media Lab. His sister happens to be a fan subber uh, for Japanese anime. So he understood the model, and then his sister vetted us out. When Joey and Reed came in together, all of a sudden started basically a dovetailing. We got oversubscribed. What I wanted to look for is uh, folks that are looking very global and that are really focused on growth. So our board, one of our mantras was, was grow, 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 and the uh, revenues come forth. Uh, and that was the kind of board that I wanted to shape, that they can just let us fail in the process, but at the end of the day, build something that's massive, learn from the data, and then start figuring out how we can uh, take it to market. Okay, the so obviously you raised a lot of money, basically $24.3 million uh, mm -hmm. plus, right? Um, was that, I mean, do you regret any of that? Was it good? Was, did it work for you? Obviously, <laughs> you exited. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have worked any other way. I think you raised nothing, right? right so you're 100% yeah. on it, and that's it's all right, been... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so two different paths. In our case, um, you have to make an initial investment. So you need to hit a certain level of critical mass in the video business to be able to even advertise. For P&G and Samsung and others to look at you, you have to be big enough in a certain market. So we felt if we don't hit that scale with some capital investment to go out and license the content, we're not going to be able to get to a proof of concept. So I needed the initial four million. And then we raised the B when we didn't need it, actually. So sometimes it's good to raise when you don't need it. Because when you need it, that's when they're going to negotiate hardball, right? So we opportunistically looked for that opportunity, and, uh, and we took it. And the same thing happened with the C. Okay. Any regrets? No regrets. No regrets. How many shareholders? This is, this is uh, a safe room. Maybe a slight regret is I shouldn't have mixed strategic investors in the Series B. It made the board a little tough. Because VCs, a lot of the time, at least the folks we had, is they would say, how can we help you? With the strategics, it was a little different. It was... How can you help us? How can you work with us? How can you do this for us? Okay. So I was, the board was a little bit bipolar, but at the end of the day, they rallied behind us. When it matters, they come through. Great. Danny, Your tell journey. us, I mean, how about you? I mean, any, you've, you've raised 
no money from outside. It's all your own money. Uh, I guess your wife as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, have you thought about raising outside financing? I know a lot of people have talked to you about wanting to invest in your company, and you've turned them down. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, I mean, I personally left uh, corporate life because I wanted to... Um, I don't, it just sounds like so cliche-ish. I mean, like, live, live your own life. I wanted to like, live my own life, um, do the things which I wanted to do. And I felt that um, I couldn't do that uh, anymore uh, you know, within corporate life. And um, while I was uh, at like, Amazon and Microsoft, I did like, do stuff on the side uh, with, with approval, uh, of course. And um, I think I managed to like, generate um, enough um, cash for me to like, leave and comfortably um, just like, cut off my uh, very um, like, nice paycheck, I guess, um, to like, um, do um, my own thing. So at the time, I started off uh, making websites. I was consulting for like, Disney and Columbia. And while I was at Amazon and Microsoft, I could like, do a website and like, sell it for like, 5 million yen, which is how much US is that, 50,000 50, USD? Mm -hmm. And then after I left, um, at that time, like, technology advanced to a state whereby people could like, make their own websites, and no one wanted to like, pay like, 5 million yen for a like, website. And um, so it was, it was tough like, uh, for a few years. Um, and at that time, I was also blogging as well, uh, like talking about uh, Japanese pop culture. And through that, I managed to like, uh, attract lots of uh, users from around the world. And um, when my website started to attract users, then uh, lots of companies, they become very interested in my users, uh, like the like anime manufacturers who make like, anime content, like figures and so on and so on. And uh, they're very interested in like, working with me, collaborating with me to like, reach out uh, to my users. So, so far, um, it's been good whereby I, um, like after creating this mascot character, I make merchandise. And uh, Mirai, she's got lots, lots of fans around the world. And um, basically, they, they really support what we do. And uh, so there's a reason why the robot stuff comes after the, the manual version. Because the robot stuff costs uh, quite a bit of cash. And uh, so I want revenue from the manual version to um, drive um, the development of the automatic version. So, so you're going to continue to bootstrap it then? That's right, yeah. yeah. And uh, any, I mean, any idea or, uh, I guess, aversion to, to raising outside funding? I think at the moment, um, what I, I mean, I'm not, um, so I'm not very good at numbers and I'm not very good at all this uh, VC stuff, um, but I've heard lots of stories about lots of folks like, kind of like losing lots of control and um, once they start like, um, like taking investment. And I feel that, so to get to this stage over here um, took us like just over a year. And um, it's very difficult for like hobby manufacturers in Japan to like get up to this stage in like just a year. I mean obviously like 3D printing and like technologies like that did help us. But I also feel that, because I was like making all the decisions uh, regarding like design, the look and feel, the materials, the process, I feel that if I did have like some sort of external input influencing that, then maybe we wouldn't have like come to this stage uh, within such a short time. Okay. So um, for the time being, I think that uh, we're good. Um, I think I'm good for now. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, I'd like to wrap up with just one last question. So we have a room full of entrepreneurs here. What advice would you give them based on what you've experienced so far? I think team, team. I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. I think opportunistically, sort of hodgepodge, finding whoever we can to, uh, to build it. I think the fastest way to build something that's, that really matters and is of value is start with a phenomenal team. And if you have two or three hitters in your group that there is good chemistry around, it makes a big, big difference. How do you meet those people? Uh, you can't, it's not like dating, right? So you wouldn't um, go out, and I wouldn't know because I met my wife at 16 and I've never dated, so, <laughs> so maybe it is like dating. Um, I think, you, you feel like there is chemistry. I think it's not a job, right? I think one definition I have for it is if you don't feel like you're building something that's, that's beyond you, and if it, every day you're not waking up excited about it, um, it's tough. So you want to find people with, uh, with that kind of DNA that you just win or die. It's an attitude thing. Otherwise, it's just too tough. It's so tough. The highs and the lows are so close. It looks organized from outside, but God, it's so messy. The outside world doesn't see it. And then all of a sudden, you have an exit. They're like, oh, he was working all along. No, he wasn't. <laughs> just three months before that, it was shit. So anyhow, so look for good people and stick around with them okay. through the lows and the highs. And they're the ones who stick around with you as well if it's working right. Great. How about you, Danny? Um, I mean, this, this would sound like very cliche-ish as well, but 
Um, I think you know, the movie The Matrix had like lots of like really really deep meaning. <laughs> and I think what um, society teaches us, I mean society generally teaches us to uh, like go to a good school so that you can go to a good college, so that you can go to a good university, so that you can get out, get a good job, uh, which like pays the bills, so that you can go to the job the next day, which continues to pay bills, so so that you can like put some money to, you know, aside for like a pension, so that you can live off the pension until you die. And um, it kind of like society teaches you like, you know, you really need like money to like, um, to be able to like do stuff. But um, cavemen and cave women, they, they didn't have like too much financing, I guess. And they just worked with uh, what they had, like sticks and stones. And um, so if you think about the cavemen and where that got us today, then um, I think it's very important to just see what you have around you. Um, you know, you may not have cash, but you may have uh, like lots of access to like networks. Um, you have like the internet out there, Google Sensei. Google Sensei answers lots of questions, and um, just um, just work with what you um, what work with what you've got, basically. Great. Yeah. Well, let's finish up there. Thanks. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jeff, Danny, Ratsmig, and what's the doll's name again? Mirai. Okay, Mirai too. Okay. <laughs>